Hello there. It's good to be leading worship again at the beginning of a new week. I'm Stephen Basilinton. You know, children love hide and seek, and they often think that they've found a secure place, but often give themselves away by little noises and shuffles and giggles. The discovering is all part of the fun. However, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us nothing in all creation is hidden from the sight of God and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. As adults we think we can hide from God. I don't know if you have an Alexia in your house but beware she can hear all that goes on and if you're not careful even the camera on the top of your computer can be made to tell somebody what you're up to. Nothing is hidden from communication today. And today we're going to remind ourselves that we fail every day to do the will of God for our lives and we try to kid ourselves that God does not know. We very rarely say the Ten Commandments in all their fullness in church these days. So we're going to do that in the words as they come up on the screen, simply to remind us that nothing is hidden from the God who has created us. And we'll say together the words that are in italics. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods than me. You shall not make for yourself any idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them nor worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God who punishes the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generations of those that hate me. But I show love to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither your son, nor your daughter, nor yourself, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the foreigner who is living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep these laws. Honour your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to him. Lord, have mercy on us, and write all these thy laws on our hearts, we beseech thee. As we read those commandments, we have to confess that we have broken them. And therefore I'm going to say a confession that we can all take to our own hearts. Our gracious God and Father, we know that we have totally failed in thought, word and deed to do what you require of us and as a result our worlds are in distress and pain. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convince us and convict us of our sin so that it is in Christ alone we flee for forgiveness and the power of his cross to redeem us and to live lives 
which reflect your purity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing the hymn, O God of Highest Heaven. The Lord Jesus, glorified God on our behalf, and he calls us to follow him.
are now going to hear the reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, read by Sam. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered round Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't you disciples live according to the tradition? Of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God, and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his, mother or his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says, says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have from you might what help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me everyone and understand this nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him rather it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean after he'd left the crowd and entered the house his disciples asked him about this parable are you so dull he asked don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. From within, for, for, from within out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual Im immorality, theft, murder, adultery, Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are many who think that they can gain a ride into the kingdom of God through taking time to hide behind a mask of reality, to wash away the contamination on their hands and clean cups and saucers and have other important things to do so that they look okay. Jesus tells us a story about those who think they can do it their way from Luke chapter 14. Dr. Luke talked to eyewitnesses. Dr. Luke carefully investigated. Dr. Luke everything from the beginning. Dr. Luke and wrote it all down. Dr. Luke so you, dear friends, Dr. Luke may know for sure. Dr. Luke the absolute certainty. Dr. Luke of the things you've been taught. 
Here's our clue for this week. What is it? Fruit. That looks good. Have you ever thought what heaven, the kingdom of God, is like? In the Bible, it tells us there will be a great banquet with amazing food and it will be the best party ever. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells us a story about a banquet. Oh, hi guys. Yeah, I'm planning this really awesome party. It's going to be so good. It's going to have all the best people and all the best food. It's going to be really incredible. We do not want to miss it. Right, I'm ready to send the invites. Are you ready? Send. But later, his WhatsApp starts pinging and he sees excuse after excuse from those he invited. This makes him very angry. Breaking news. People who have been invited to the party of the decade have decided not to go. You said no to the party of the century. Why? I could just bought a new field. A really nice field, but I haven't seen it yet. I need to go and check it out. Be good to go today. It's really more, I mean, it's important. I just uh, bought five yoke of oxen and uh, you're going to go and uh, try them out. Can't you do that um, later? No, I can't. Oh, I just got married. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a bit more important to me right now than the party. <laughs> right. Okay. What rubbish excuses. They've just received an invitation to the best party ever and they would rather do something else. It's a bit like you being invited and saying, I need to finish my Lego tower or I need to walk the dog. The man called for his servant and said to him, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Well, go out into the roads and the country lanes and tell everyone to come so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those invited will get to come to my party. The insiders, those invited, the important people, they don't go to the party. The outsiders, the poor, the weak, the ill, the unimportant people, they do get to go to the party. Jesus was telling this story to a group of Pharisees, insiders, very important religious people. They would have definitely expected to be at the great banquet in heaven. In fact, they would sit in the most important seats. But in the story, people like them don't make the party their priority. They choose to do other things instead. So they miss out. Everyone would have expected heaven to be filled with important religious people. But Jesus is saying heaven will be filled with outsiders, people who make Jesus their priority. This story gives us a glimpse of the great banquet of heaven, like the greatest party you could ever, ever imagine. And we are invited. Will you make your excuses and miss out? Or... Will you say yes and make Jesus your priority? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you want all people to know you, old and young, the poor and rich, and the people of every race and nation. Thank you that we believe and trust in you. We know for certain that heaven will be our home one day and you have prepared good things for us. Help us live with our eyes fixed on Jesus and trusting in this great promise of life with you forever. Amen. We should.
plan I had because he's coming back one day. And those who've heard and believed his word will be prepared to celebrate. Be ready, be ready. The king is gonna come again. Be ready, be ready. His reign is gonna have no end. Now some believe they don't breathe. So here's the truth in this simple tune We should always watch and pray And we'll be glad when the Lord comes back If we're trusting Him today Be ready, be ready The King is gonna come again Be ready, be ready His reign is gonna We need to be directed and invited by God into his kingdom and he has provided his son, the Lord Jesus, to direct our pathway. And so we will sing, show us Christ. This tells us that there is no one else who is sufficient for our need. After we've sung this hymn, Simon Pilcher will speak to us from Mark's Gospel. i 
together shall we in today's passage Jesus says this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me so Heavenly Father please give us soft hearts help us to listen to Jesus please show us our own hearts and also show us our Savior Amen Well, it's great to feel clean, isn't it? I don't know if you've had that experience. Uh, Maybe it's after a hard day's work in the garden uh, or you've been for a workout in the gym. And it's that wonderful feeling afterwards as you scrub yourself clean, as you wash away the sweat. Uh, I love that uh, warm, tingly, fresh feeling that you get after a hot bath or after a power shower. It's great to feel clean. Well, it's great to feel clean on the outside, but what about on the inside? Do you feel clean on the inside? Many of us feel dirty, dirty because of what we've done, things we've said, thoughts we've had, grubby for the things of which we're ashamed and which we bitterly regret, or because we've allowed things to happen and we've just silently watched on. And some of us may feel dirty as a result of things that have been done to us. Each of us will have corners of our own hearts that we know are not clean. That feeling of being dirty inside, that's a universal human experience. Well, today, Jesus is confronted by people who are focused on the issue of ritual purity, ritual cleanliness. Uh, Today's issue is not just about washing up. Today's question is, how can I be clean? How can I be clean on the inside? And what we're going to see is that there's a wrong way to try to be clean. And the wrong way is man-made religion and human rules. And we'll see that there's a right way to get clean on the inside, and that is by accepting God's grace. Well, first up, we meet some scribes and some Pharisees, and they've come from Jerusalem. Together, these people could have been described as the cleanliness experts. The scribes were the people at the temple who interpreted the law. Uh, Think of them as the cleanliness police. And the Pharisees, well, they were meticulous at trying to live clean lives. They were experts at obeying the rules. Now, we've already met these people in Mark, and they weren't friendly towards Jesus. And today, they've come a long way. 
perhaps 90 miles, and we can see that they've come in order to find fault with Jesus. Now, the issue seems to be about washing. And we read in verse 3, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. Well, hand washing is a big thing these days, isn't it? I agreed to take part in a government survey and just a few days ago I had to take a Covid test at home. And in the space of less than 10 minutes, I had to wash my hands three times for 20 seconds each time. Well, we don't want to catch the disease and we don't want to pass it on. Well, the issue back then wasn't Covid. It was more about whether you might have contaminated or become contaminated by somebody else before God. Had you got too clean to some dodgy person in the marketplace and might they make you unclean before God? And so the Pharisees had devised these elaborate rules about washing. Now, these weren't things that the Bible required. These were additional rules and traditions made up by men. Keep all these rules, they thought, and you'd ensure that you weren't contaminated by the ritual uncleanness of others. And we can see here that they're shocked that Jesus' disciples don't appear to be following all these rules for ritual washing. Aren't you bothered about being clean before God, Jesus? Or well, Jesus doesn't mince his words. He quotes the prophet Isaiah and he calls them hypocrites. Jesus had two issues with them. First, he says, they pretend to honour God, but in fact their hearts are far away from God. And second, Jesus says they have a problem of authority. Their man-made rules have taken the place of God's rules. Their traditions are not in the Bible. Perhaps they intended their additional rules to help people keep God's rules. Perhaps they started in a good place. But, Jesus says, what has now happened is that their rules now go directly against God's law. Jesus points out that by keeping your rules... You're in fact breaking God's commands. Now, God had commanded that we should honour our parents. Now, it's not just about young people respecting the authority of mum and dad. It's also about us caring for our parents as they get old. Providing for them, helping them, giving them time, loving them. This honours God. It's the right thing to do. But the religious bods of Jesus' day had issued a ruling to get round your obligation to your parents. If you give the money all the time that your parents need instead to God, well, that way you don't have to help them. And Jesus showed that this man-made rule ensured that they broke God's law. They were showing lip service to God. Oh, I'll give my money to God. They claimed to be serving God, but in fact their hearts were far away from him. You say you're a believer, but your actions show otherwise. Now, it's easy to point the finger, isn't it? It's almost comforting to see the faults in other people we may not be able to see, so we may be able to see for some people where their traditions go against what God has commanded in Scripture. We might wag the finger at them and say, oh, that's wrong. You must follow God and not your traditions. 
some people will say that we must follow our society's view of what is right and moral, even if it causes us to go against God's view as revealed in his word. And there are a number of issues where our society fundamentally disagrees with the Bible. Now, we too may be tempted to side with our culture and so go against God and the scriptures. But even if that's not you, we need to look into the mirror, to look at ourselves, because we all have rules too. Now, in our house, we say grace before meals. We thank God for what he's given us to eat. Well, I say that, but actually we only do it in, before lunch and our evening meal. But for some strange reason, we don't say grace before breakfast or before a cup of tea and a slice of cake. But Pilcher family tradition has it that we thank God for our lunch. And it's good to thank God. It's good to be grateful. But perhaps it's just a routine. Perhaps it allows me to overlook the ingratitude of the rest of my life. God wants us to be thankful, grateful people. But we've invented a rule to help us to be thankful. Perhaps, though, it's just become a ritual that masks my grumbly, grisly, godless heart. Well, let's think about another rule. I aim to read my Bible each morning and to pray. Now, some people might say that this is the way to start the day, that this is a really helpful rule. But does it somehow become the measure of how my Christian life is going? I mean, if I've read my Bible, does that mean that all is well between me and God? Does my daily Bible reading take on a greater importance than my actual obedience to God? Do I hide behind my daily time in the scriptures instead of really living for Jesus? Religion gives us rules to make us clean or to keep us clean. Hindus might wash in the Ganges. Catholics might attend mass or make their confession. We might say that attending church and being in a Bible study can be helpful. But not one of these things will make us clean. None of them puts us right with God. You see, man-made rules are superficial. They don't keep us clean and they can't make us clean. In fact, they're far worse than that. Because man-made rules provide a convenient mask for us that hides the underlying reality. On the outside, we might look very religious. People might see our devotion and think, oh, she's really holy, or God must be pleased with him. We might even delude ourselves into thinking that because of our rule-keeping, that we're on the inside track with God. We might conclude that we're keeping ourselves clean. But Jesus says that it's what comes out of a person that defiles a person. Look at verse 20. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. I don't know how you react when you read that list. 
not many of us will have an actual murder chalked up against us. Murderous thoughts occasionally may be. We can keep ourselves pretty well under control for much of the time, but the challenge is that we're always fighting our hearts. And which of us can say that we are never guilty of envy, slander, arrogance? The truth is that my heart is corrupt and rotten. It may not be as bad as it could be. And most of us keep the filth of our hearts pretty well hidden. But the reality is that my heart is diseased. It's true that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. The real problem is not what I do, it's who I am. It is this that defiles me. Our natural tendency is to slip into man-made religion, but this is the wrong way to try to be clean. The right way to get clean is to accept God's grace. Now, in the very next story, in the second half of Mark chapter 7, we meet a woman who realises that she needs an act of mercy and grace from Jesus. We just had a bunch of very religious men come to see Jesus. And now we have a Gentile, irreligious woman. Her daughter has an unclean spirit. And she realises that she herself is unclean. She recognises she's got no claim on Jesus, no rights whatsoever. And she just begs him for help. And that is what she gets from Jesus. Grace and mercy. How can we be clean? Not by what we do. Not by rule keeping. No, we need help. We need help to deal with the uncleanness that is within. We're helpless. And we come to Jesus... For grace. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. However dirty we are, the blood of Jesus washes us clean. Let's pray together. We do not presume to come to this table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Please wash us clean, by Jesus' blood, shed for us on the cross. Amen. It is through the blood of Jesus shed at the cross that we can come into God the Father's presence and be freed from the damning power of sin. And so we're going to sing the hymn, How Can I be free from sin.
through the precious blood of Jesus that we are now able to come in prayer knowing that God hears us and he knows our deepest longings so we're now going to be led by the Holy Spirit as Philip prays shall we pray O God and Father of all whom the whole heavens adore let the whole earth also worship you, all kingdoms obey you, all tongues confess and bless you, and all people love you and serve you in peace. Our Lord and Saviour, we praise and thank you that although we do wrong each and every day and deserve to pay the penalty for this, you willingly and freely took our punishment and released us from our guilt and shame by paying the ransom through your death on the cross. Our slate has been wiped clean. Thank you that this means if we have faith in you as our Saviour, trust in you, believe and accept what you have done for us, you declare us righteous, and we can be reconciled to you and have the gift of eternal life. Gracious Lord, we know that not only did you save us from death, you saved us for a purpose, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and serve you and share your amazing grace and love with others. Help us to please you and make the most of every opportunity to make you better known to all those we come across in everyday life. O oh Lord, we pray for the world that is suffering due to our disobedience. We live in a world that appears to be out of control due to the impact of COVID-19. Conflict, natural disasters, which can cause such devastation, poverty, homelessness and hunger. 
we thank you that you are in control of this world and that you care about all your creation. We bring before you India, in the grip of a second Covid wave, with the world's largest number of daily Covid cases, with hospitals filled to capacity and a shortage of oxygen supply. Give the government wisdom and enable the health service to respond effectively to this crisis. Bring comfort to those who lost loved ones and calm people's fears. We pray for the poor, for whom the lockdown is causing severe suffering, many of whom are our Christians and who now have no work and no income. That they may put their trust in you. We ask that you would give them the knowledge of your fatherly care and grant them your strength and peace. May they be able to impart your love and comfort and hope to others at this desperate time. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would strengthen those who are struggling at work, those whose jobs are threatened, and those who have lost their jobs to the impact of the pandemic. Help them to trust in you, to guide them in the path ahead. We pray that they won't be disappointed or discouraged, but ask that you will comfort them and show them the way you want them to go. Give the peace in the decisions they make. Help them to see this experience not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Lord, in this unstable and confusing world, show us all that your ways give more meaning to life than the ways of the world. Give us strength to hold on to faith in you and keep alive the joy we have in Jesus. Lord God, we pray for the works of the Stalt Valley School Trust, our mission partner of the month, particularly for the new direction they have taken with more of a focus on chaplaincy. Seeking to be more like members of the family residents in the community, and to represent Christ in the school community. Thank you for the blessing in seeing God at work in the school communities in which they serve. Help the trustees and school workers as they seek to expand the work and to impact more communities of young people with the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Lord, please bless the school workers for the one-to-one -one sessions Kit Haynes has with pupils and her lunchtime chaplaincy drop-ins. For Andrea Gasson, who asks that we pray for more open doors in other schools, protection upon the workers' families, and more opportunities to show Jesus' love. And for Nicole Williamson, who has recently returned to work for SVST part-time after maternity leave, as she adjusts to a new role of supporting the ministry behind the scenes and for her plans to work with some schools in Bishop Stalkford as a chaplain. Please, Lord, be in her conversation with schools and staff as she seeks to get this off the ground. Lord God, we thank you for all the consistency of your caring love. Thank you that in Jesus you came to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and salvation to all your people. We pray for those we know who are unwell or going through a difficult time and need your help. Please give them your comfort and peace and may they know that you love them and are with them at all times. We thank you that we know you are with us when we are sad and things are difficult. Please comfort those who have recently lost loved ones. Help them to be increasingly assured of the hope of your salvation and eternal life. May they be aware of your presence and know your blessings and promises at this time. We ask all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in the Saviour's Blood that great hymn by Charles Wesley, where he marvels at the mystery and majesty of the total provision of 
God in our Lord Jesus Christ and Saviour.
Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, for we were straying and have returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.